<clears throat> and we're live. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. And thank you so much for joining us today. We're here to talk about marketing technology stacks, all of the important aspects of evaluating and why it's important. And we've got a great panel with us. So today's panel, Seth, I'm going to hand it over to you. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Seth Early. I'm founder and CEO of Early Information Science, and I've done a lot of work around marketing technology and uh, evaluation of technology stacks and built some methodologies around that, done a lot of writing and research and so on. So happy to uh, share a lot of that with you guys today. Thanks, Seth. Cheryl? Great. Hi, I'm Cheryl Schultz. I'm the founder and president of Cabinet M, which is a marketing technology management platform used by large B2B and B2C organizations to track, document, visualize, and report on their technology stacks. So as a career marketer, I've had a front row seat to view the changes in marketing over the last five to 10 years, and I'd love to see the impact that technology has had on marketing. Not much has changed, right, Cheryl? Yeah. <laughs> no. No, As in no, everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Dave Scribella, Managing Director here at Early Information Science. While I consider myself more of a data and content guru, I have found myself working with many digital marketing leaders over the past five years who struggle with the enormity of their marketing technology stacks. So we're excited to jump into the uh, content today. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. We want to thank our media partner, CMS Wire. CMS Wire is always promoting us and putting out some great thought leadership. And we want to make sure everybody connects with CMS Wire on a regular basis to see what they're, um, <clears throat> what they're putting out in the world of content marketing and digital marketing. We are recording today's session. A link to the recording will be sent via email after the webinar. And please be sure to share that with others. The session is anticipated to be about 50 minutes. We want to leave the last 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. So please remember to submit questions in the Q&A box in the, uh, in the webinar. And finally, your input is valued. So we do have a poll and we'd really appreciate your responses uh, and feedback afterwards. So today's agenda, uh, we're gonna start with the problem with marketing technology. <clears throat> we're gonna talk through how, how things have changed or evolved or maybe become exacerbated in large companies over the past decade or so. Then we're going to talk about how to assess, you know, what is, a, what is a, a practical approach to look at your marketing technology stack. Uh, and we're going to walk through our six step approach to start that audit and get through it. And finally, market, managing and tracking your marketing technology inventory. So there are definitely different ways to do this. You know, the larger your company, the more complex the architecture, uh, you'll be very much enabled and accelerated in that journey if you've got the right tools in place to guide that. So why do we have marketing technology in the first place? <clears throat> so marketers have been around forever. The proliferation of digital tools uh, has, has certainly brought to bear new options uh, across different categories in marketing technology. But overall, the purpose has always been to engage with customers. And that's really throughout their journey. You want to meet your customers where they are and help to address challenges and solutions in ways that they prefer. Uh, through different channels and certainly the devices they're using. You want to help them solve their problems or select products and services. And once they are a customer, you want to make sure that you can provide the right service and support to ensure ongoing satisfaction and customer loyalty. Why do we want to evaluate a marketing stack? Well, <clears throat> marketing technologies are complex. They're a part of a larger information ecosystem. You know, today it's not uncommon to see large Fortune 1000 companies with 100 to 200 plus applications just sort of in the realm of digital marketing and marketers. And that number is growing exponentially every year. So a MarTech stack really provides a lot of things. It provides a way for your customers to discover your products and solutions. It provides information to support that purchasing decision and hopefully make that as frictionless and seamless as possible a way to complete the transaction or direct the customer to a specific distributor <clears throat> or a way to purchase the products. And of course, once they have purchased your products, you know, ensuring that the right supporting materials are there, the ways in which they're provided across different channels are optimized to really meet and address the customer experience. What are some of the challenges that we see today? 
To effective digital marketing, you know, there's a fast changing ecosystem. So <clears throat> the technology landscape is shifting on a regular basis. What was very commonplace or maybe standard architecture five years ago is very different today. We've got an emergence of cloud technologies and, and certainly the options that are self-service or you know, marketing teams, middle management can procure directly without IT in intervention is, uh, is fairly significant. You've got many inputs to the life cycle. That means that you've really got <clears throat> different parts of your organization touching the customer journey and responsible for different stages in that journey. And if not effectively managed and coordinated, that can result in some siloed experience and certainly sil siloed processes and systems. If I can add to that, Dave, I think there's another aspect. So, you know, when we talked about this the other day, certainly the service of those stages of the life cycle require lots of different parts of the organization. But then we start looking at uh, making decisions around changing the stack or evolving the stack or, you know, evaluating and looking at the functionality. There's lots of different parts, lots of different stakeholders. I know Cheryl's going to talk about that a little later. Lots of different stakeholders and their needs and uh, their plans. And many times just getting them on the same page, getting that those objectives harmonized, getting clear about what our strategies, what our engagement process is, that's a big problem, right? So there's two pieces. You know, there's the there's the tools that 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 have lots of different inputs to the life cycle, and then the whole requirements and uh, and and uh, needs of the organization also has lots of different perspectives. And if you want to add to that now, Cheryl, I know you're going to talk a lot about that later. But uh, yeah, the only other thing I'd say is there's another dimension today, which is the whole work from home, work from mm -hmm. somewhere, hybrid working, which means that people aren't in the office sitting next to one another anymore. And so it means that you need to spend more time deliberately understanding this. So what are some other challenges in complete views of customer needs? So we talk about personalization <clears throat> and the contextualization of a customer journey and that experience is the, the holy grail. The more technologies you kind of put in front of that, um, the more complex and maybe uh, disorganized or fragmented um, you can make it. So you're actually in some cases working against that, that shared goal. So what we're seeing is the, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was gonna interject there as well because you know, part of it is also understanding those needs in enough granularity that you understand how to provide a personalized and contextualized experience. The story I tell is when we did this project for uh, an organization that built a personalization architecture. So we built out the data models, the content models, the customer models, we built out the workflow processes, built all the infrastructure around that. And at the end of the project, you know, they had these different segments and these different personas and, and at the end of it, they're like, well, what's, what message should we say to this one that's different from this one? And they really didn't know. They really couldn't define what a personalized experience was. So that talks about not only the, the lack of understanding of the customer in, in, in detail, but the lack of maturity of that supporting process, right? You can have all the great technology and infrastructure and data models and data and content, but What's a differentiated experience, <laughs> right? If you don't know that, then then all the, the tools are you know, we're not. <clears throat> right, right. Um, FUD, uh, one of our favorite mm -hmm. acronyms, right? So fear, uncertainty, doubt, uh, or fear mm -hmm. of missing out, and market pressure. You've got lots of vendor claims, and certainly lots of vendors making those claims. Not many are delivering, and the the idea that. Um, you can procure and procurement and provisioning of software as a service is much easier. Uh, doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to get what is promised in those initial wait, sales. Wait a minute. Let me just get this clear. You're telling me that a vendor has made promises that they haven't actually been able to fulfill. Am I getting that right, Dave? You are yeah. getting that right. <laughs> the old one is what's the difference between a used car salesperson and a software salesperson? Or I can make it a marketing technology software, whatever. What's the difference? You know the difference, right? Use the person knows when they're lying, <laughs> especially with AI and machine learning. <laughs> um, complex organizational alignment. So again, marketing technology has sort of forced a new level of fluency, you know, and it really requires uh, a lot of integration and coordination with, with different teams. And you have to build out those processes, uh, especially as you're building out certain analytics and measurement of those technologies. And that really needs to be thought of as you're making and, and implementing and rolling out uh, technologies in the stack. 
And of course, the hard parts are not fun. Um, governance and sort of the oversight of the architecture can be neglected. Uh, it's sort of an afterthought. It's not the sexiest thing in the world, but you know, getting this right really requires that you have the, the people and processes in place to keep it right. And now a poll. <clears throat> so here we want to understand what, what describes your environment. Is it uh, disconnected? Uh, where it's really fragmented, scattered, and so on. Or maybe you have a platform approach, <clears throat> but you still have sellers. Like you may be using Marketo, or you might be using HubSpot, but there's still different pieces of this that are in silos. You may have multiple tools, but you, you have clear ownership, or you may have kind of a, uh, a uh, marketing uh, technology stack nirvana. It's harmonized, well-governed, and uh, set with centralized oversight. Cheryl, did you want to add any nuance to this as we're as we're getting the uh, uh, the the, uh, the choices coming in? No, the thing I would say is that um, everyone thinks everyone else is doing it right and having centralized oversight, and the reality is that there's really a spectrum out there, and you're somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> as I. As I expected, there's not anyone in content uh, in uh, marketing technology nirvana. I know uh, we're just going to give it a few minutes here and, and move on. But again, you know, we have this spectrum. We have situations where things are really, really disconnected and disorganized. And it's kind of, you know, marketing technology chaos. But then we also have situations where, uh, you know, people do have uh, tools, but at least they have ownership and they have some, some uh, governance and of course, the critical piece of this is harmonizing the data and being consistent with the architecture. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> excuse me and end this poll now, uh, and uh, I think we can just share results. So it was just uh, you know across the board, just kind of a, a um, uh, an even split. Uh, not a huge, not a huge uh, a number of, of um, responses, but I think that's that's fine. So let's keep going, <clears throat> Dave. I think you are going to start walking through this piece in terms of step, steps to the to the process. Yeah, thank you, Seth. So we talked about, you know, how to start the audit. <clears throat> One approach we've uh, taken with our clients is the six step approach, right? So it starts with the customer experience. We want to map out that customer experience, understand challenges, pain points, especially as they, you know, apply to specific tools, the information, the knowledge that's required. If you've actually got that figured out uh, or have done, gone through that exercise uh, recently, great, you're, you're, you're a step ahead. Uh, but then we want to think about the engagement strategy, right? So this is where it's sort of the right tool uh, for the right job. And is it really fit for that purpose? We've seen a lot of clients really overinvest in certain areas, um, maybe delivering an experience that is appropriate for top tier customers is, is something that we're trying to do. But in, in essence, they did it to kind of everybody. So thinking about the segmentation or the tiering of your go-to-market strategy, of your customer experience, how you want to promote and maybe organize information for research and discovery uh, differently for some of your top tier customers, especially in a B2B context mm. is critical here. So you really want to think through that. Yeah. I think the other piece of this is, you know, depending upon what your uh, enterprise strategy is, perhaps you are uh, looking to be a low cost provider. Well, that's going to require more automation, less high touch, or maybe you're at the other end of the spectrum. You're going to provide white glove service. Well, that has different implications around the tools that you use and how you're engaging. So, and even in the same company, you may have you know high high end uh, uh, customers and high end products and high margin products, and you may be also selling commodity products. So you have to be able to gauge that and be able to apply the right approach to um, to the engagement and the right tools so that you can support those different types of segments, those different types of strategies and so on. Did you wanna to add to that, uh, Cheryl? Do you have any nuance there? No, we'll get into that later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, step three, once you've done the engagement strategy and customer experience piece, you wanna actually do an inventory and survey of all of your tools, right? So what is the current state architecture? What do we have that is serving part of that marketing technology and customer experience journey? And what do we need to understand in terms of upstream processes and how data and information are flowing? Um, we're going to definitely get into more detail on some of our recommendations to go through that survey and inventory uh, with software to assist you. 
Assessing the quality of deployment. So this is really looking at each tool and how it is effectively deployed. What is the quality? You know, what are, are you getting the right return or the expected results from that deployment? And there's a way to kind of scorecard that, you know, for each different technical uh, tool in your stack. Defining the future state. So if there are gaps or clearly areas for um, improvement, you know, we want to look at the future state. What is a what is a good marketing technology stack and a rationalized architecture? Those are big words, but you know, essentially, what's the right architecture for the customer experience you need uh, as an organization? What does that look like, and how do we help you get there? Right. So you kind of want to bridge the gap between current and future state. And finally, the implementation plan and roadmap. You know, it's marketing technology and, and marketing, digital marketing teams always have large portfolios and lots of competing projects. It's a matter of prioritizing the ones with the right impact and actually getting the measurables to help with those impact assessments. One of the things that we didn't specifically call out here, but is part of the methodology <clears throat> is the importance of a particular tool to the stage. I'm gonna get into that a little bit. Cheryl's gonna get into that as well. So it's understanding the, the stages uh, of that journey, the customer life cycle. It's understanding how you're engaging in each stage. It's understanding the tools and which tools are most important. How do those tools fit in to that stage? How important are they? And then really, then we start looking at the quality of deployment and say, well, how good a job are we, using, are, are we doing? So how important is the tool? <clears throat> how well is it deployed? And there's a bunch of different factors around that. That's what you want to do to prioritize. Say, you know, what's the most important stuff and where we where do we have the biggest gaps and the biggest pain points? And that helps to inform prioritization and focus and uh, the roadmap. And again, we're going to get into a lot more detail on that. <laughs> Excuse me. So one of the things that we we're talking about is that, you know, different uh, uh, organizations will have different types of life cycles, right? Different industries, even the same organization could have multiple uh, customer life cycles and learn, buy, get, use, pay supporters in telecom, discovery, awareness, consideration, purchase, retention. And this could vary between one organization and another. And But they really all boil down to common elements, right? The, the, at the end of the day, and I'm sorry, I'm going to go forward and then come back. But at the end of the day, you're trying to learn, you know, make customers aware, make prospects aware of what you have. You want to be able to help them make that selection they have to execute the transaction. They have to use the product or service. There has to be some mechanism for supporting them or maintaining, and then something to continue to build that relationship. Now I'm going to go back and say we have different classes of technology, and this is just these are just broad categories, and you can get into finer degrees of nuance. But different tools will have different value depending on the stage. So. When we're talking about inbound uh, uh, technologies, when we're talking about web content management, that's bringing people to the site, search engine optimization, uh, and so on. When we think about it, at the learn stage, where you're just building awareness, you're not transacting yet, right? You're not, you're not doing e-commerce yet, and you're not necessarily uh, you know, giving them access to a knowledge base because you're trying to build that awareness. So that might be outbound uh, email marketing, it might be campaigns, it might be draw, drag, uh, uh, drawing people to the site who's SEO and so on. But then when you start looking at this, again, across these stages, <clears throat> the different tools will have a different uh, degree of value, different importance, functionality. So building awareness, you know, we need uh, analytics no matter what. We need to understand web metrics. We need to understand, you know, campaign responses. But really, we're looking at inbound and outbound in order to bring people to the site and make them aware. We're trying to optimize our, our site and our content for organic search, to be able to rank in Google so they can find out about it. You know, maybe we're segmenting lists that we're either uh, have from trade shows or we're doing some type of advertising, whatever it might be. But this is building awareness of the offerings. So when you start putting this into the context of the different stages, you know, are all technologies of, import, of equal importance? No, they're not, right? Because certain technologies may be able to be used at a stage, but they're not most important to the stage. And I'll illustrate that through uh, for this. So the two things that we have to look at is how important is the tool to the stage and the engagement strategy, meaning that particular segment and those customers. And again, if we have a complex solution, it's a big ticket item, it's going to be very different from a commodity product. And it's going to have put different demands 
on your marketing organization and your technology stack. And then the, then the question is, how well is it deployed, right? Is it deployed uh, in, in, in the best fashion? Are we making the best use of all of its functions? Many times there's there overlap between one application and another, right? And you could use two different applications to do the same thing. One's going to be better at it, or maybe you're using more of the functionality for that particular stage. So again, a tool could be part of a suite, but maybe you're only using a fraction of those capabilities and you have a specialized tool for this. So this is where we have to look across that life cycle. Now, these are broad categories. And what you can see here is that you know, inbound is going to be useful for learning and choosing. Same thing with outbound. But again, maybe the purchase, because we haven't, uh, we haven't, uh, we're, we're not necessarily, we, we're not necessarily doing a transaction at that point. Outbound may not be as important, again, depending upon the organization for that purchase process, right? Maybe you are doing a campaign, but when you think about it, we're not transacting yet. But again, when you start looking at inbound technologies, are they useful? Meaning that's uh, search engine optimization or or, uh, or uh, uh, email marketing or anything that we're trying to do to, to bring people to the site, uh, is that going to be most important for that particular phase? Now, we get a little bit more nuance here and a little bit more granular, right? We're not doing any transaction in learn and choose, but we are doing it when we're actually purchasing. But when we look at this in a much more granular level, we say, well, what are those particular inbound technologies? Again, Web content management, SEO, site search, personalization, chat, knowledge base, configuration. And these are not hard and fast uh, delineations. You know, there's overlap, there's, there's, you can classify things in different ways. But now we can see that, well, web content management, SEO are really important in that learn phase. But maybe site search isn't important in the search in the learn phase because they're not there yet, right? But once they get on the site, Site search is much more important. It's much more important for the choose phase. So you can start to see <clears throat> that, you know, these different types of tools will have different levels of importance depending upon where they are in, in that uh, journey, in that life cycle. Then we talk about the quality. So we need to know the importance of the tool. Is the tool supporting that stage of the life cycle and that functionality? And then how well is it deployed? It, and you know, there's a lot of uh, detail behind this, behind the health of deployment, behind the health of the, tech, of the uh, architecture and the data and so on. But basically, we're trying to classify these as, are we doing a good job? Is it well utilized? Is it well deployed? Or are we not doing a good job and it's poorly deployed? Or is it somewhere in between? Right? So the, the issue is you want to prioritize in the areas that are highest importance and poor quality deployment. And this is what this comes down to. We may have more than one web content management system. We're saying it's really important in the learn and choose phase, but you know it, it's well deployed in, in, uh, with one system. It's, it's okay, but it's sufficient in another. But then we may say, well, wait a minute, let's look at site search. Well, site search, but and, and look at this, we don't really care about the mediums and lows. We only care about the areas where it's of highest importance. Then we look at site search and we say, well, wait a minute, <clears throat> where is it most important? Site search is most important when we're choosing, when we're purchasing, when we're maintaining. We need to be able to find the right information. Uh, personalization is going to be more important when we're choosing. Now, again, you could argue that they could be important for other phases, but for our example purposes, we're saying that this is the most important piece and we are not doing a good job. So we don't care about the lows and the mediums. We don't care about the greens and the yellows. We care about the high importance tools that are poorly deployed. That is where we begin to focus our efforts so that we can prioritize, because otherwise you have a mass of tools, you don't know where to start, and it's really saying what's most important and what's most broken. So that's what it comes down to. Seth, we have a comment in the chat. I think oh, we actually please, sure. this. It says, wow, we went through the life cycles by industry so quickly. Can we take another quick peek at that? Oh, sure. Let's go back and take a quick look. Sorry, guys. And we will actually, you know, have this for you. But but this is, again, it, the generalized model is that you have to learn about things. You know, you have to be able to make a selection. You have to do the transaction. You have to be able to use the product or service. You have to get some kind of support and maintenance. And then there's ongoing advocacy. So these are just general, these are more specific types of journeys 
according to industry. But even within a single organization, you could have different customer life cycles. You could have different segments, different personas. Cheryl, did you want to add any uh, color commentary? Uh, yes, I'm going to jump into my slides next. So this is okay. perfect setup for me. Okay. Any other questions from, from folks on that particular piece? Okay. Yes, you will have a, a copy of the slides. Absolutely. Yes. There's a lot. We have a lot packed in here. So we realize <laughs> go pretty quickly. <laughs> But let's keep going here. Sorry, I should, I should not be, I should be pausing my share while I'm doing that. But let's jump in. So now we want to talk about how do we do that inventory. I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl. Um, let me know when you want me to move to the next slide. Do you want me to just jump in or do you want to have a little preamble here? Yeah, so um, what we're going to talk about now, we spent a lot of time talking about sort of the different stages of auditing and looking at your tools against the landscape of what you're trying to achieve with regard to your customer experience. And I actually love the poll that was done because what it says to me is exactly what we see in our customer base. There are a range of experiences that organizations are having in terms of tracking what it is that they're using. You know, some people don't do anything at all and some people work hard at it. And what I want to do is spend some time talking about how you go about um, building the inventory of your MarTech stack and what you should actually be capturing from an information perspective. And then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the importance of managing holistically your stack. So, um, so every stack audit should actually include an inventory of your tools. So after, um, you know, if you look back at what we've already talked about today, after you've looked at what you're trying to accomplish, you have to understand where you are today, right? You can't move forward unless you know what you've got. And so what you want to do is take inventory of all your tools. And so most, um, most organizations think about going about that just by looking at what am I using? But again, um, today we don't all sit in the same office. We don't, you know, we can't walk up the hall and say, what are you evaluating? What are you working on? So you want not just the tools that you're using, but also what are you evaluating? It is, you know, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of money to be looking at the same tool or the same category of tool in California and New York and not knowing about it. You also want to document and capture the tools that have been retired. Maybe a tool didn't scale, maybe a tool didn't integrate, maybe you hated the customer service at a particular vendor. You want to capture that information so you don't have to keep revisiting it. We're living in the world of the great resignation, and so there are a lot of moving chairs. So having all of this documented is super important. In addition, what you want to make sure of is you're looking at not just the tools that you're paying for, but also the technology that you've built in-house. So we see a lot of internally developed technology. It's been developed because a tool didn't exist when a company needed it, or the perfect tool doesn't exist for what it is that's critical for them delivering their customer experience, so they've built it. But in order to holistically look across your stack, you've got to know what did I buy and what did I build? In order to get started, what um, I always recommend is identify your stakeholders across the information. You've got to do this. You don't have to do it in person. You can send out surveys. You can send out email. In fact, I often um, recommend to organizations that they should send out a template of the types of tools they're looking for as a first pass of trying to uncover them. It's a lot easier to answer the question, what am I using for attribution? What am I using for marketing automation? Then ask the question, uh, what are you using? Um, a lot of people say, well, I don't know. So better to do that. So stakeholders live everywhere, right? They live in marketing, that's a given, but they also live in sales. Increasingly, we're seeing stakeholders in HR, in IT, and then if all else fails, 
go to finance and start looking at those credit card records in order to understand what it is that you've got. And by the way, that's an excellent way of finding your zombie products. And zombie products are those products that are just renewing every month and nobody's using them anymore. Or maybe somebody checks in with them once every four to six months. That's not a good use of your money. The other thing you need to figure out is how you're going to capture that information. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about that because that's our business. But many companies start with a spreadsheet, but they find that as their stack grows and as they're trying to capture more information, the complexity of tra tracking information this way starts to become problematic. What we see is organizations tracking between 20 and 50 different attributes for every product, even though they start slow by just identifying the product. Next slide. So identifying your inventory is just the start, right? Knowing what it is you've got is just where you um, start from. You wanna capture a lot of different information about the tools that you're using. First and foremost, like what are you using the tool for, right? What is it, is it, you know, um, are you using it for email marketing, video marketing, using for marketing automation? Um, this is supposed to be a living, breathing inventory that you can share with people as they ask the questions. Um, how is the tool performing? How is it helping your organization to meet all the objectives? And um, as well, where does it fit in terms of what you're trying to do? Is a tool associated with your sales funnel? Is it associated with your customer journey? Why do you own it? Who owns it? And how many users of the tool are there? Um, a lot of organizations, particularly in M&A situations, end up with a lot of tools doing the same job. So understanding who owns it and who the users are is critically important because if there's a casual user, for one tool, and then there are lots of users for another. Sometimes there are hard decisions that have to be made as you start to look at the future state of your stack. Understanding your contract details, super important. And the reason is, first of all, you should just know what they are and keep them associated with your tools. But also, as you start to rationalize your stack and start looking towards the future state, once you have them all in one place, you wanna understand if a tool is doing 88% of the job and you have three years left on a contract, but you have another tool that's doing a similar job at 92%, but it expires in six months, you're probably going to work hard to get what you need in that tool that may not be performing exactly the way the better performing tool is. So you work on it, work with the vendor. I generally find that vendors these days are super responsive to user requests. And then you want to look at um, security and governance issues. So, you know, one of the things I'm sure many of you experience is InfoSec checking in periodically to say, what are you using? What's it connected to? You know, is it connected to any of our internal systems? So understanding at the very least, is this tool collecting PII? Is this tool GDPR compliant, right? All these regulations that will bite you if you don't know is really super important. And then lastly, and Dave referred to this earlier, you want to have a very clear picture of how information is being exchanged between tools and how they're integrated. So anything else you guys want to add, you know, Seth, Dave? Yeah. Well, I think we talked the other day about um, the excuse use case. Uh, yeah. We were a webinar with uh, Stephanie, actually a podcast with Stephanie Lemieux, who's an old colleague of ours uh, on our early AI podcast. And she was talking about the fact that you have a use case that's an excuse for doing a project, but then you get all the other uh, ancillary benefits from it. So there may be one clear you know, objective and it, and it has a documented um, value and, and it's easy to understand the ROI, but then there's a lot of other stuff that may be more difficult to understand or explain and more abstract or less measurable. 
the security piece is your, so we called it an excuse case, right? The, the use case, that's the excuse for doing the project. This is your excuse case. Your excuse case is the information security and privacy issues. You have huge liabilities, potential liabilities and exposure. This is something that the CIO cares about. This is something that the CEO and the board of directors, everybody cares about this enormous exposure. They'll spend huge amounts of money on this. That is your excuse case for doing yep. this. So if you look at it from that perspective, you can get all this ancillary benefit from getting control of that marketing stack. They may not, they give, may give a rat but about that, right? They may not care about, but they will care about information security and governance and PII and exposure because there's reputational risk. There's all sorts of things. That is your excuse case. And use yep. that to be able to look at all this other stuff. Yeah, we call that the sleeping better at night case. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, next slide. So um, one of the things that's critically clear, and I'm sure all of you see it in your organizations, is that managing your technology and understanding the inventory is not a point in time case. It's something that's highly iterative, right? Because after you audit and know what it is you have in your stack, the next thing you're always looking at is what else do I need? Um, some of that is in response to requests. Some of that is looking at new products in order to respond to requests. But everyone is always looking at what else they need to accomplish something. And so you need a way of continuously looking at that. Um, you also want the ability to constantly be able to look at your architecture, being able to quickly respond when someone says, how is our data flowing from one point to another is really, I don't know how many of you actually have that experience. Maybe I should have inserted a small poll in here, but mm -hmm. um, that's super important. Um, one of the things we touched on quickly, but you know, we see a lot of is the fact that organizations don't necessarily know all of the skill proficiency inside of their company. And so often tools are discarded because it was purchased and there's nobody in the organization who expertly can implement it, use it supervise it. And so understanding and then aligning your skills with the technology is really, really an important part of MarTech management. And then really looking constantly at what your contract details and spend looks like is important. Um, at the very least, everyone here should have some way of setting a reminder for your contract renewals. We have all been caught out by contract renewals. And so putting it on a calendar, finding a tool that'll do that is really important. Um, anything else before we go to um, my last slide? Okay, great, next slide. I would do it all. Cool. So um, there are a lot of reasons that managing your stack is really important. We spent you know, a lot of time here talking about um, how you go about doing that. But you know, the impact is really, really important because you see it in multidimensional ways. First of all, once you know what you have and you know how your tools are exchanging data, how they're integrated, how they're secured, you really see improved tech performance. Um, and that is super important today, particularly as we start to look at metrics like, you know, customer lifetime value and the cost of customer acquisition. And we're constantly being asked, you know, what's the ROI of that tool? But that's a whole other webinar. Um, you know, reduced expenses. By understanding what you have and where you are, um, you can start eliminating your duplicate contracts. We've seen organizations that have started this process and identified that they had five different instances, we're talking about Fortune 100 companies, five different instances of the same marketing automation platform. We've seen companies that have had four or five different marketing automation platforms. You might need two. You could build that use case, but 
four or five is sort of ridiculous. So um, super important to understand where these products fit and what their purpose is. And then, you know, at the end of the day, we're all sort of working harder to do more and improve productivity is critical. So, you know, making sure that you don't have multiple people doing the same thing inside of organizations, really, really critical. Um, taking the time to document how you're introducing products to the rest of the organization and across the marketing teams that you serve is very, very important because it stops the question of, can you get me this tool when you already have a tool in your stack that serves the same purpose? And then um, having a single source of truth, a system of record, if you will, provides teams with the ability to collaborate in ways they haven't done before. We spent a lot of time on this already today, but um, our environment today requires new ways of doing things. And you know, fully documenting and inventorying what you have is important. And then um, we just looked at the excuse case, the sleep well at nice night case, but you know, understanding you know all your governance issues and your security and exposure details super important to getting peace of mind so next slide okay many people may have seen this but this rings true to me and um now that we've invested in this marketing tech stack what's the roi that's a good question for a new analytics tool we should buy yes and a new layer for data visualization. And so how many times did we just sort of move on from one tool to the next? Hmm. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. Yeah, that's great. So um, go ahead and put any questions in. D Dave, I think you had uh, some come up uh, that uh, in the conversation, I think you had something. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So I, I was actually a question for Cheryl, right? You, you see a lot of how marketing teams are deploying <clears throat> or purchasing different tools and applications across the MarTech stack. So yeah. what's what's really hot in the year 2022? What are what are companies buying a lot of, maybe even over investing in a little bit? Yeah, so you know, 2021 into 2022, we saw things that actually make a lot of sense. Although my guess is a lot of companies have probably overinvested in some of them. You know, e-commerce hot as could be, right? Um, everybody is focused on e-commerce and e-commerce tools, um, workflow, right? Being able to actually look at workflow um, from remote organizations, you know, really important analytics, um, web performance and security. So those were the very, very hot products in 2021. And the we see a, the same in 2022. In 2019, 2020, you know, 2020, we saw lots of personalization, ABM. And it's not that those are falling off. People are still implementing programs around them, but they're not as hot as they were then. If you had to... Um look at a category that you're seeing the most retirement. So I think that slide you showed before was discard, right? Are there any categories where there's a lot of retirement of systems just because maybe they don't necessarily fit a real purpose or need in that customer journey anymore? Yeah, so that, you know what, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm going to say something that's totally counterintuitive. Um, but, you know, we see a lot of, you know, a lot of discussion around, you know, data lakes, you know, CDPs and data orchestration platforms. And, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on all of those vendors right now to really differentiate from one another. But we do see some retirement in those areas. Um, what we do see, and this is a different way of answering this question, is a lot of your larger vendors are becoming platform vendors. So you look at your HubSpots, your you know, Adobe's, et cetera. And as they increase the functionality in their platform, we still mm -hmm. see that customers are buying best in class, but mm -hmm. they are in some cases buying best of class. And so some vendors, um, 
end up being retired just because the platform vendor has something that integrates easier and that's more accessible from an anchor platform they already have installed. So you're really seeing a simplification of the stack just based on the evolution of those platforms. And as they scoop up some of those other best in breed, I think one of the challenges to that is, you know, you, you, when people talk about, well, it's an integrated platform, you know, many times they're not as well integrated. It's more marketing. Yeah, integration, I agree. You know, or messaging integration. And there's yes. still architectures. There's still, you know, brittle integration. So it, it's, you know, you got to be careful about what the vendor is saying about their integrated suite versus what the reality of the integrated suite is. Yeah, I agree. And we actually see that the majority of our users are still building best in class. There are very few stacks that we look at where we will see, you know, two or three layers of functional marketing technology and they're all Salesforce. So they're all Adobe. We do see it. But the other thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, we see stacks growing rather than contracting. Even though the goal is to get highly efficient, we still mm -hmm. see stacks growing. And even last year, we saw $39 billion invested in marketing technology. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money. And, and when you say, you know, what's the rationale uh, for organization? When you say you see them growing in an enterprise, you know, is it is it just that the 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 uh, functionality is so nuanced in terms of problem solving, or do you think people are kind of, you know, maybe getting uh, <clears throat> controlled by, by the vendor uh, sale rather than controlling the procurement? And you know, they're much better at selling than you are at buying, right? Yeah. So a yeah. lot of practice doing that, and maybe you're not buying as many as much, which is of course why, you know, this kind of expertise is valuable. But what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so, you know, we actually see it on a curve, okay? You know, organizations, as they get more efficient in their stack, what they start to do is look at what are the things that we have not done yet? What are our peers doing? What do we hear other folks doing? And then they start looking, and that's one dimension. The other dimension is that, um, think about AI and machine learning. Really, five years ago in marketing, you didn't have a broad category of AI-based products. Right. And so organizations now are looking at that and saying, where does it fit in my stack? You know, same thing for um, influencer platforms, right. Right? right? The last five to eight years, they've mm -hmm. grown up. So in terms of maturity of stacks, mature mm -hmm. stacks are looking at those as, um, as a way to automate more right or grow faster. Right. I think the other challenge around, you know, the AI aspect is, uh, you know, everybody who's looking for any kind of funding or market positioning is AI powered. And yep. <laughs> the reality is there's been machine learning embedded in a lot of stuff already over the years. And now we're calling it out for things that are, you know, that have been traditionally part of machine learning and traditionally part of an aspect of AI um, are, are, are uh, being relabeled or rebranded, you know, text analytics, the sentiment analysis has always leveraged some kind of uh, machine-based classification, right? And some yeah. type of, um, of clustering technology. Well, maybe it's always already been in there, but we weren't calling it that, right? I mean, we were talking yes. about analysis 15 years ago, right? So it's there, but it's being rebranded. So I think people have to be a so little true. bit about some of that as well, you know, and really yeah. say, the nature of your AI, what is the what are the algorithms, what's the training set, those types of things. So there's a little bit of you know positioning, I think, and rebranding there. I completely agree. And we see people using AI and machine learning interchangeably yeah. all the time, right? right? right. So right. I mean, you know, it'll get better. Yeah. yeah. So we have a couple of offers here to to kind of get started. Um, uh, Cheryl's company has a 14-day free access. And uh, Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about what we can do to help uh, organizations get started? Yeah, we have a, a, a four to six week audit service. You know, our offering is around kind of following through those six steps that we laid out earlier. You know, the the intent is always to, as Cheryl laid out, there's you know, 
a benefit or goal and objective in terms of saving money, you know, improving customer experience that could be, you know, multiple uh, mm -hmm. goals um, and just really going through that process to understand what you have and where you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, and you can find out more about that by reaching out to us directly or mm -hmm. going to our site and the link here will be included in the slides. Yeah. And Cheryl, how about uh, your your offer? You you typically offer people some access to your tool to-, to We do, it yes. So what we're happy to do is you can reach directly out to me or you can go onto the platform to that link and you can request 14 days of access. What we do is we provide complete access to all of our functionality that includes the ability to document fully your stack, visualize it and report on it, not just your tools, but also your contracts. In addition, we collect a lot of data in the back end of Cabinet M. There've been over 800 stacks that have been built on Cabinet M that we consider to be research worthy. And we give you the ability to um, to mine our anonymized aggregated data, to look at the tools that most often are used when someone like you is using a particular tool. And if we work together, we'll make some deal that uh, you guys will appreciate. So let's yeah. uh, have a conversation about that. So yes. there's a little bit of uh, synergy here. Um, are there any other questions? Are there any other things that... Uh, uh, either you guys want to cover or is there anything from the audience? Because uh, I think we got a couple more minutes and we can certainly give you back a few minutes to your day. Dave, do you have anything else that's come up? No other questions in the chat here. No. Sharon, are you seeing anything else? Okay, well, listen, um, again, here's the, there's some resources to take a look at. You'll get these in the slides. Um, here's the contact information um, that you can take a look. It's cabinet M. Uh, dot com and of course early.com for, for early information science and uh, thank you so much Cheryl this has been a, a terrific session and uh, we're partnering so we're looking forward to uh, working together and uh, bringing this uh, this uh, uh, getting the chaos under control for, for <laughs> thanks for having me this is great it's been great thanks. and thanks Sharon and thank you Dave and we'll see all of you folks next time and we're going to give you back uh, eight minutes to your day don't spend it all in one place. Take a priority break. <laughs> Take a meditation break. <laughs> all right, everyone. Uh, thanks Thank for you all. Bye-bye.